on to our next session. It's on the latest wave of AI startups in India and ecosystem. And uh, this is a session where we are going to be elaborating on the giant corporate investment in technology innovations, uh, which have made it possible for many AI startups to emerge and find their way to success. Uh, and uh, uh, for that, we have uh, our panelists, uh, who I'm now going to invite on stage, uh, Mr. Vineet Narsimhan, CTO and founder at uh, Crystalli.com. AI, Mr. Toby Basford, uh, VP Talent and Culture, Cloud Factory from UK. Let's all uh, welcome them with a round of applause, please. And show some energy here. We've just had lunch. Mr. Vishal Singhal uh, is a co-founder and AI evangelist at Cellstrat. Mr. Yashoraj Tyagi, CTO at Cash E. Requesting uh, you to please join us on stage. Himanshu Ghauri. Uh, from PwC India, he's the Executive Director. Mr. Siddharth Singh, CEO at uh, Quail Infotech. And uh, Haubam Joyremba, CEO and MD at Cube 10 Technologies Private Limited. So a distinguished panel here to elaborate on the AI startups in India. And uh, Siddharth is going to be moderating the session, so I'll uh, give it over to you. Thank you. You have time, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I know, so this is a post-lunch session, and uh, uh, the first task is for us to stay awake, so hopefully we'll be engaging enough uh, so that you guys get a little bit away, right? And, uh, and none of us yawns on the podium as such, right? Thank you. Uh, the topic, uh, just to introduce myself quickly, and uh, I'm Siddharth Singh. I manage uh, a firm called Quail Infotech, and we are a company which is focused towards automation and bringing AI capability into automation, right? And by automation, we don't mean uh, automation of the industry or the factories or manufacturing side, but mostly, uh, automation inside companies, functions that are operated today by humans on digital interfaces. We work towards automation of that. Uh, so we bring a digital workforce into the world uh, through a tool called Ivozo and bringing in capabilities which is like computer vision, anything that requires a judgment uh, in operations is what we look at uh, automating through our low code tool called Ivozo, right? That's in a nutshell about us. The topic on AI wave in the country. I think uh, uh, most of us know the reality that today, uh, if you don't include the word AI in your pitch, somehow it doesn't work out, right? So every startup will include these two letters in whatever they do. That's very, very interesting. And I, I think I heard an earlier panelist talk about how loosely we have started using it. Uh, but the fact is that there is a very sound story next to it in terms of what the startups are doing today. You know, and whether it's in healthcare, whether in spaces like uh, using agriculture productivity improvement, whether it's AI for uh, using in language processing, fields like these, across the board, Indian startups are making a great headroom. Uh, the statistics behind it, right, the various analysts which have pitched that AI as an industry for our country is going to be close to be a trillion dollars in the coming 10 to 12 years, right? That's what uh, industry analysts are pitching that this, can, this uh, technology can do for our country, right? Uh, as of now, the workforce of AI, India provides about 8 to 10% workforce on AI in, in the world, right? That's a very high number. But yeah, of course, uh, it's, it stems from the fact that IT is very, very popular in the country and we feel uh, that AI is a natural extension of how IT companies have been operating. So servicing uh, international companies continues to be a big priority. The questions that still remain, and that's what this panel will discuss as, as we move on, is how is the ecosystem supporting this new wave of AI startups that's occurring in, in the country? You know? uh, if you look, the ecosystem we talk about involves how the resource pool is going through education, how universities are catching up, how is the government supporting this industry as such, how are the industry itself monitoring and regulating itself. And there are a lot of doubts and things that need to be done. You know, just a few days back, I was addressing uh, Amity University on the same topic, and, and there were various questions and there were various thoughts, and most 
common thought was that, will AI take away my job? You know? And that's the level where students are sitting today. So uh, I think that, that one question got asked repeatedly by various people across uh, the session. Uh, we had a good two hour long session. And it took some time uh, for the entire panel that was with me to convince people that no, AI is not going to take away your job, but AI is going to augment the way you do your job. And that simple thought shows that there is still a lag in how universities are teaching education around AI in their course, course classrooms and the sessions and, and the courses that they are conducting. Uh, the next question that is doubt is still a big doubt is the ethics in AI. And I think that uh, one was brought about by an earlier session. I think Shrikan talked about it very aggressively that we, a lot of time AI in India, what, what people do are you know, they're using algorithms which are developed in the West and trying to remodel it and repackage it for an Indian environment. The fact of the matter is that there are a lot of challenges in doing that. You know, if you look at even a simple algorithm of facial recognition, uh, in, in the West itself, when, when a study was done around ethics of that particular algorithm, what was found out that it's biased towards whites rather than uh, uh, any other ethnic uh, uh, color people. And now why was that? Because it was developed by whites. All the testing and data was uh, sets were used were for white people, right? And a lot of time that algorithm was pointing out black uh, youngsters or kids as threat to the society, just because it did not have uh, uh, enough data pool or uh, diverse data pool when the algorithm was built. Now, when we use such algorithms in an Indian context, we take that bias and bring it to India. You know? So how are we regulating this? How, is, how are we ensuring that industry itself, when they start using AI, are using these ethical practices and are incorporating in, in whatever they develop? That remains a challenge. And obviously, the moment I bring this up, the question and availability of data sets itself becomes a challenge. Most of the data sets that are being used to train AI models are actually controlled and owned by global Western firms, right? Facebook today is a large data set source. If you look at Google or Android for that matter, you know, I mean, uh, there was an interesting discussion uh, uh, that a Microsoft senior executive who actually manages Teams, I hope we were not using Teams in the earlier session, she was part of a panel with me. And she said she was discussing with her husband uh, at around five or six in the evening about uh, let's get, that, get our house painted for Diwali, right? By seven o'clock, she was getting messages from a large paint company about paint prices and what she can do. And she was talking about it. So that basically means that whatever discussion was happening was being monitored through the mic of her phone by some app, by, uh, uh, by the Android network, right? So how, is, how are we going to regulate this? And how are we going to use data sets in the right way to actually and have control of those data sets that are being used. So there has to be a, a clear ecosystem with the involvement of policies, governments, to actually help regulate and as well as control how these uh, algorithms are developed and tools are used. This is just in a nutshell to start off this session and hopefully some of these scary things woke you up. Uh, otherwise what we'll do is we have a set of questions where that we'll run after and I'll invite Mr. Joyaramba to start off with the first question, uh, what the question is, what are the reasons behind the boom in the emergence of AI startups uh, is, is the current question. Yeah. So Mr. Joy Ramba, over to you. Hello. Uh, <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, basically, I'm from the state of Manipur. It's a very small state in the northeastern part of India. And uh, when we talk about AI, the perception that you have in the cities and the metropolitan cities and the bigger cities and the towns and smaller towns in the northeast, it's a, it's a very different scenario. Uh, we are struggling. The state is a the state uh, in the state in the, the state of Manipur or rather the other states of northeast. They are struggling uh, with the issues of uh, rather incorporating automations or maybe computerizing the offices and the schools. And now the big revolutions of AI has just dropped as a bomb. Uh, but AI is not an alien thing to, the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to this part of the world. Uh, AI, as you know, it has been there for almost 70 years now. 
uh, it has been with us, uh, you know, on our Facebook, on our Google, or maybe on any other devices. Uh, but I think the, the three main factors are there which actually enhances the growth of AI uh, as an industry. Uh, maybe I think, uh, I believe the advancement in the uh, hardware is one of the major factors which has actually uh, given a growth in the AI. Because in the late 1960s or in the late 1950s, when AI, were, AI was just introduced, the computing power was not there at all. And that was a big, big factor that has actually hindered the progress of uh, the, the, the AI as a technology, as a tool in everyone's life. Uh, but if you again look into the scenario of 1950s or the late 50s where AI was introduced, it was in 1964, I mean, it was in the Apollo 11, I think it was uh, launched in 1969, 64, 1964 or 69. So when you talk about an Apollo 11 being launched in the moon, and AI was introduced much before that, and the stage at which we are now, I mean, is a huge gulf of difference. It could have evolved much more better as, and much more faster than it should have been. And uh, uh, so def the, definitely the computing power is a big challenge. But at the same time, uh, whether we have actually withdrawn ourselves or whether the government of different parts in the world have withdrawn themselves in terms of research in AI. And why, if it is so, then why? Because if you look into Hollywood movies, you would have seen lot of, lots of AI-based, robot-based, intelligence-based machines working. Even then, there has been a hindrance. So maybe you may be having a question, or everyone is having a question, why has this AI not developed the way it, has, it should have been? in the last 70 years. So computing is one thing which I, I believe that has actually changed. The second thing is in terms of the data. Now data and data set, as uh, he has just mentioned about, is one of the biggest factor in you know, molding or rather incorporating and uh, setting up the entire AI, AI ecosystem. Now I would just like to bring into context uh, certain things uh, which relates to the Northeast. Now, uh, Nortis as a part of the country is something which is, which is quite irrelevant to the entire country of India. And many times uh, you are asked, where are you from? And uh, 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 you need to answer, and not only answer, but you need to explain the map of India and ex start explaining <laughs> where we are. <laughs> but so, uh, so um, I believe, uh, I believe uh, just having this context in your mind, you'll be able to know what would be the situation of IT, forget about AI, in the state of Northeast. But definitely there has been a massive change. Uh, we, have, we have just inaugurated uh, the first IT innovation hub in the entire Northeast, which works on uh, robotics, AI, and IoT. And uh, it is one of the best centers in the entire Northeast. Uh, we have been working on e-governance, uh, various e-governance projects. Now, what we have done is AI as such is not a commodity or it's not a physical entity that people can simply see and, oh, yes, AI is coming. It's, it's, it's in a state of utter chaos. Now, if we, if we try to focus this set of people in one direction, then I, can, I, I believe that, I truly believe that we can produce multiple Teslas in the next five to ten years' time. Yes. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yashraj. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, sorry. Thanks. Uh, that's, that's again a good question. And thanks for uh, everybody's comments. I think it's broadly been covered. But what, what I'd say over here is that, you know, uh, why, why, why was India able to produce some of the largest uh, multinational IT companies like uh, TCS and Infosys? Because, uh, and one of some of the largest in the world. And why, or, or say, why does India have uh, banks with the largest number of branches in the world, right? So some of the largest banks in the world. That is because, you know, there is obviously a very strong uh, economic and consumer demand. There is talent to support that. And there is infrastructure, both from an actual infrastructure and policy intervention level that allows you to do that. So uh, as far as uh, a Tesla or an Apple is concerned, 
uh, you know, I'm obviously that's a notional thing about Tesla and Apple, but I assume that company uh, which is as cool as that. I think that we already have a lot of very cool companies coming up in the last couple of years and largest number of unicorns being minted ever in the history of India in the span of the last six months alone in 2021. That is because, again, there is a strong economic and business need. There is talent. And as far as creating a very large organization is concerned, it is it then boils down to actually doubling down on that infrastructure and that demand and building value over and over on that same uh, base itself, which I think a lot of uh, startups in India are doing. So I do think that as uh, uh, as we were just discussing that there, there's going to be a tremendous number of uh, such companies coming up in the last next five to 10 years. Uh, Vineet? Yeah, I think I'll second what uh, everybody on the panel has said, right? So I think, uh, so if you just uh, look at uh, last uh, few decades, right? So you had the IT services organizations really uh, scale in India and grow uh, and become really globally recognizable. Uh, then over a period of time, I think product companies uh, in uh, India have started uh, catching up significantly, uh, right? I think fresh out of my mind is the fresh desk uh, listing uh, on NASDAQ, right? Uh, earlier in the month, uh, right? Who would have thought, uh, let's say five years ago that you would have a Indian SaaS company uh, fully based out of India really get a billion dollar listing out of uh, NASDAQ, uh, right? So, and that is possible today. Uh, so, there is enough uh, depth uh, of uh, talent in India. There are uh, interesting uh, uh, startups and uh, co other companies uh, really uh, creating wonderful products. Uh, hopefully, it's just a matter of time. Uh, really looking forward to uh, companies like uh, Tesla come out of India someday. So. Thank you. Thank you, Vineet. Himanshu, what do you think? PwC agrees? <laughs> <laughs> Hi. So I think uh, uh, let me give my opinion <laughs> that uh, will will be uh, in line with uh, you know so, so with whatever my fellow uh, you know panel members have just iterated. But I would take a couple of more examples. Uh, India is poised to become the AI hub uh, in near future. That could that that future could be next couple of years or could be next five years because of. Uh, you know, uh, the strong talent in terms of the across data analytics, big data, IoT, whatever, machine learning, you know, the good terms which we know, which are part of ecosystem of AI, the entire uh, talent is already there. It's just a matter of time when this whole region will become AI hub. That's number one. And we have seen uh, a strong RNG in the US. We have seen the strong implementation of those ideas in China. But if you see the, 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 the actual, you know, the coders, the developers, the talent who actually build this entire uh, ecosystem lies here in India. So, so it's, it's all up to us how we, you know, uh, take this to the next level. But another data point is because which will help us to understand that this is going in the right direction is that uh, 66, uh, you know, unicorns in just a decade. And, and I think the pace in the last couple of years is just tremendous. I think in next, uh, whatever we have done in a decade, I think we'll be able to do it in just a couple of years. And, you know, and then we'll have multitude of unicorns uh, uh, emerging from India, and hence the make in India for global. This could be the next punchline, I think. Thank you. Thanks, Imanshu. Brilliantly put. Uh, let's get an outside perspective of this. What does Toby think? <laughs> um, what does Toby think? Um, first of all, I, my life motto is who says you can't. So uh, my starting point is um, I, I, an ultimate belief that these things should very well be possible. There's nothing that I see that would lead me to believe anything otherwise. And actually, if anything, the global scales are definitely tipping towards a, a far more connected global economy. So, and I, again, I believe the pandemic has only pushed us far more strongly in that direction. So, um, the, the resources and the market 
um, as well as access to um, opportunity is only getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So I think the hindrances or the barriers uh, that may have been in the way are rapidly coming down because of the way that um, the global economy is, is very rapidly changing. So um, absolutely, I'm looking forward to getting to know uh, um, in more detail, I think, the, uh, the market here so that um, yeah, hopefully we can play some role in, in supporting and encouraging that as well. Fantastic. Thanks, 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 Toby, uh, for bringing this out. And I think the lovely thing will be when, in a similar panel discussion in UK or US, they'll be discussing whether an Indian company can be replicated out there or not. So <laughs> that'll be more interesting point. Uh, so with this, uh, I'd like to open it to the forum and the audience. If there's any questions that you'd like to ask the panel, I have one hand raised. Yeah, I just want to add one point to your previous discussion about Tesla. Like, I think like uh, we should focus more on the you know autobiographies of different kind of entrepreneurs entrepreneurs like uh, Elon Musk and you know others and their life journey should be discussed also so that we can create more entrepreneurs like them in India. Yeah, well, the very interesting point actually there was a nice author that I used to like reading. She wrote about a lot of Indian uh, entrepreneurs, uh, I think ex-IIT and uh, Ruchi Bansal, if I'm not wrong, uh, Ruchi Bansal. She used to write about small biographies of all these entrepreneurs. Probably you'll love reading yeah. her as well. I think, I don't know whether you've come across. Stay hungry. Yeah, so, yeah stay hungry, stay foolish, stay right? Foolish, so, yeah, yeah. Correct. Yeah, th that's, that's the one. And I loved it. And it's a good example of real life cases. Uh, thank you so much for bringing it out. Anybody else you want to add to this? Yeah, there's a question there. Oh, sorry, ma'am. I just want to add actually uh, that. Uh, you know, if we have to think out of the box, our great prime minister, you know, he does a lot of thinking. It's time the corporate also now came out with their own ideas uh, because we may have the opportunity for long or not, but we must carry this country forward and, you know, make a leap jump for the next 50 years, I should say, in our lifetime. I would say in my lifetime, I wanted to see some real Teslas and all in India. So that we can do by convergence and uh, by cooperation of corporates together. We may not have, you know, if Hindustan Times and Times of India can go together and, you know, go for a particular newspaper, we can also probably, corporates can join and they can, we can target, you know, we can have a targeted uh, approach. For example, just one thing I want to say that now, just now, there was always in the news on ET channel and all we are watching that there is shortage of toys, stuffed toys and everything. But we, everybody watches and every government, the corporates and, but there's no forthcoming of this that, okay, now let's get it. And in a week's time, let's make a program. And by December, by Christmas, we must deliver and get the export orders through our consulates and this, that. You know, these are the kind of targeted and hitting hard that will give us result. So if we can get some corporates together, maybe we can have four Teslas in India. Fantastic. Fantastic point, ma'am. And uh, uh, applause to that. I think all of us have been talking about this, that uh, it, it, it's a complete collaboration between government, uh, enterprise, educators, and it's very nice to see uh, all represented in this forum. And, and you're still young, ma'am. Hopefully, it'll happen pretty soon. <laughs> so don't give up hope on us uh, that early. Uh, any, anybody in the panel wants to add to ma'am's question? Yeah, uh, uh, not only just corporates, I would like to add, ma'am, uh, that even the government of India, you know, and we are sitting under the umbrella of Niti Aayog right now, correct? I mean, they have come up with a very focused, uh, you know, AI strategy uh, for India as a nation, correct? I mean, that in itself says very few countries in the world actually have that strategy in place. Now, that's just a building block, correct? I mean, which will be a reference doc for all the corporates, you know, and then all the uh, talent hubs across the globe uh, to follow that strategy and then uh, you know sky is the limit I mean like we said I mean and so many Teslas could be there in the next few years if we follow it judiciously. Fantastic thank you uh, okay uh, we have one question from here and then one last one from there uh, in the interest of time you <laughs> So if bringing in Tesla is nothing what is the best next, uh, next best thing to do? <laughs> You're caught now. <laughs> uh, thank you for catching me. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, the PwC representative has put it very well. Uh, keep putting a policy in place is one of the uh, best things that can happen. But at the same time, putting a policy in place actually drives your country and your state or your place together in one particular direction, which is not also a good sign <coughs> in one way. 
Now, if you look into Tesla, how Tesla is made, we are talking about people who have just completed their PhDs or their engineering in computers, they want to become an entrepreneur and they want to do AI. Not knowing the actual scenario and the difficulties being faced by the people. Now there are another set of people who are in their own set of businesses and not wanting AI or not knowing AI as such. Now there's a huge divide between these two people. Now what is required is that of course we need policies and programs driven together we should not go in one direction. We have to close our eyes and think, what am I going to see and what is going to be the requirement of India or of the whole world in the next 10 years? 2030, how is it going to be? How is it going to be in 2030? Is Facebook going to be the same? Is Instagram going to be the same? Is IoT going to be the same? Or is there something that can come up in 2030? That 2030 or 35 has to be my target and start thinking from now. Because it cannot happen now. Mm -hmm. So that, that is my thing. So in order to have four or five Teslas in India, we have to start closing our eyes first and start thinking of 10 years from now. Thank you. Can I just start one thing? Sure. I think this is controlled. Yeah, yeah, it's, on on it's on now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, see, the reason uh, why we celebrate Tesla, right, if we just take a step back, right, uh, is because of how really it has kind of s gone through that entire cycle of failure uh, and then, then from the ashes really almost from ashes risen back, right, uh, where it is uh, really uh, in everybody's mind. Uh, what is critical is that at that time it could have gone the other way. It could have really uh, failed as well, right, uh, completely. Uh, we uh, so that's all that I would have on this point. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Yashwaraj. Very uh, insightful uh, points that you mentioned. The next uh, is around fundraising, you know, and uh, particularly uh, fundraising for AI companies has shot up uh, exponentially in the last few years, you know, and some statistics are saying that it's close to 900 million to a billion dollars a year now for startups in India. So this question goes to Mr. Himanshu Gauri, and how will AI impact corporate investment and fundraising in startups in the coming years? Uh, thanks uh, for the question. And uh, uh, my name is Himanshu Ghavdi. I am part of PwC uh, India. And uh, uh, my role is primarily into the client service industry, correct? So I can give you a few examples related to what exactly is actually uh, happening on the ground uh, within the corporate setup as well as within the ecosystem of uh, startups. startups. Uh, when we talk about any of the any of the sector, let's take, let's say, manufacturing sector, primarily the, the entire ecosystem right now, all the way from customer to vendor, is kind of looking into a kind of integration, wherein when, whenever there is a prediction happens on a sales side, your engine should be able to pick it up and do a demand forecasting. And that demand forecasting needs to be linked back to your inventory. Those inventories needs to be tied back to your supply chain. And in the end, your supply chain needs to link back to your vendors, suppliers. So you can see there is only one trigger, which is your sales. But at the back end, this whole you know, integration uh, slash AI models slash uh, machine learning algorithms are happening, which is helping all the big corporates right now and the entire funding which, which is the question, is actually going into that direction right now. Whether it's uh, you know, top, top of the automobile sectors, which we can think of, or retail, e-commerce, everywhere, even fintechs, the entire model is how to link your customer back to your supplier. So this whole ecosystem, and in between there are multiple layers, because it depends which industry you're talking about, but net-net, it's your customer, experience needs to be enhanced and then bring agility back into your entire supply chain. So that's where the funding is going and that's where the entire logistics startups, manufacturing based startups uh, are looking into solutions 
moreover the solutions like you know uh, predictive and preventive maintenance kind of solutions in this sector so that's where i'll just pause but just to give you an idea it's any sector you talk about it's your customer which is in the focus right now and at the back end the entire supply chain uh, integration related touch points which are having interventions from the ai and ml uh, at this stage thank you thanks thank you himanshu uh, a round of applause for himanshu and one personal question so is pwc also giving funding to startups <laughs> No, thanks uh, for asking, but I will I'll, I'll have one input on this. So we have an incubation center uh, in Hyderabad. Uh, uh, it's known as T-Hub, uh, wherein we are actually working closely with the uh, nation's startups uh, ecosystem over there. We are helping them to incubate their ideas. So please feel free to go on the website and, you know, you can. Thanks, you can thanks, thanks, Manshu. And I'll make sure to collect your card before I leave, sir. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, the next question is around a major issue that's facing, and uh, I think uh, uh, the panelist on this one had a cheat sheet because we were discussing this just before we came in and started this panel. So the question is to Mr. Toby Basford on why is talent management at startups important? Um, yeah, hugely important. It's really, um, there's a real danger, isn't there, when we think AI that we focus in on the technology. Um, but actually successful organizations of any kind are actually by the integration of people with technology. So we have a, a, a we obviously work in the AI space uh, with the organization that I am on the leadership team for and we talk very much about the importance of the human in the loop. So I don't believe at this point in the evolution of AI that we are going to get credible solutions without maintaining as a very integral element um, the human. And so it makes building organizations that not only create great tech, but integrate people, a fundamental part of the fabric of how we build any organization, any startup. And I think it's one of the big misses. There are a number, number of reasons why I think many startups fail, all the way from the most common being people create products nobody wants to buy, through to not thinking about some really critical elements. And I believe culture and people talent management is one of the fundamental elements that any startup, however you want to define that, um, needs to give really good attention to. Even more so now, um, if we wanted to do a quick history lesson, which I won't bore you with, but if we want to look at the last 30 years, okay, WWW was written by the first time by Tim Berners-Lee in 1990. Um, that's when the internet, I was at university, well, no, I wasn't quite, I was nearly going to be going to university at that point. So we're still at the very front age of a complete seismic shift in the way that we understand um, the impact that this technology is going to be having. It's changed, it's changed politics, it's changed um, uh, communication, it's changed human relationships, it's now changing where people live. So we're getting a reverse industrialized process where people are now beginning to move back out of cities because they're able to do so. Certainly in the UK, we've got a massive shift out of London to people living um, back in localities again, because who wants to sit on a commute train for 90 minutes um, when you can sit yourself at home and still do exactly the same job that you've done through a global pandemic for the last year and a half? There's been a huge shift over the last 30 years, only accelerated by a global pandemic. And it's also changed the nature of, of human relationships at work. It's very, very important that we understand the impact because we still have many, many leaders who are running lots of organizations who have been nurtured in the industrial age mindset of how you manage talent. How you manage, manage talent in an industrial age is it's based on what is commonly known as a hierarchy, which came from the production line. The production line said, I'm the boss, I know how it should be done, I'm gonna create a process that you need to do what you're told on. And so my job as a boss is to manage to make sure everybody does exactly what they're told. And so created the hierarchy inside most, modern, most organizations. That's massively shifted. If you've got anybody under the age of 30, they don't want a boss, they want a coach. They want to work in an environment that's agile. We have what's called a heterarchy that has been introduced into the organization. A heterarchy is a far flatter environment where people expect to be treated very, very, very differently. We have this Netflix generation of people who don't expect to be treated as a cog in the wheel, but they expect to be treated as an individual. 
Because when you arrive on Netflix, when you arrive on any of your platforms, guess what AI has now served you up is Toby. This is what we think you'd like to watch today. So what do people expect when they arrive in your workplace? Toby, I'm gonna manage you just in this beautiful, perfect Toby-shaped way. And if you can't offer that, guess what happens? Is they start being driven purely by money. If you wanna compete based on money, you're probably playing a fairly finite game, in my view, in the way that you manage talent. I think the way that we need to think about managing talent is recognizing the culture and the time that we live in and taking a very, very different approach and recognizing that it's actually the development of the individual and the creation of an environment where they genuinely feel like they are a net contributor, that they are an owner inside the environment that you're creating will drive towards a far better retention of the best talent that anybody in this room needs if you want to be able to build an effective startup or an effective scale-up. So we were, we were chatting, weren't we, about um, you know, how I, I'm getting to know the uh, Indian um, market a little bit, although a huge market, which no doubt has lots of variations across it. But we were talking about the scarcity of talent and how it jumps around so quickly because there is a scarcity of particular kinds of skill set. Well, that is true globally as well. Um, there's this phenomenon called the Great Resignation that certainly is well documented in um, the US and the UK and other countries, which is really a post-pandemic response. Now, we've got, a, we've got a question that we need to ask about what we want to do in response to that. And my response is, um, we want to be competitive with our salary, but I do not want to win people through salary alone because I don't believe it builds a retained healthy culture in the long run. I want to think about what it looks like for us to build a holistic strategy where we actually are able to maintain people's loyalty to what it is that we're doing through understanding them as a human being. If we commoditize the human, then we will begin to drive a particular kind of behavior from them. And so understanding in the way that we even develop leaders of startups and the culture that you're creating inside of the startup, understanding how you manage your talent, I would say, is one of the fundamentals that's going to drive your success uh, in the midterm. Um, I could say lots more, but I will leave it there just for now. Uh, very interesting insight, Toby. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Okay, uh, so uh, I'll now get in, throw in a question which came in and, uh, and ask the panel to give their independent views one by one and request them to keep it short. So the question that came in uh, some time back uh, while in discussions outside was, uh, do you think India can produce an organization like Tesla? And what would it take, what support would it be required for it to become an organization as innovative and as fast moving as a Tesla? or an Apple for that matter. So I'll probably start off with uh, Vishal, uh, since he's sitting next to me, so he got caught. So Vishal can give his views, and then we can kind of rotate it across the panel. I think it can. it is possible if all students and all developers uh, get aggressive at it. Uh, we have two students from school who have produced a machine learning uh, model to, uh, to do heart disease prediction. Now we are talking to their parents to get them deployed on the cloud. We have a second year engineering student who, who has almost earned about three lakh rupees from us in last two years. He is kind of product lead for us. He is mind boggling. He is kind of equivalent to 20 engineers put together. Uh, his, he always tries to do everything perfect and, and to the point. Uh, he never uh, was to do a second grade work. I think students have immense potential. If they are given right opportunity, right platform, it can be done. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Joaramba. Uh, I think Tesla is nothing. Uh, in a way that if you <laughs> look into the... <laughs> If you look at the vastness of the country as, as big as India and diversity, the diversity of India, then Tesla is, uh, you know, a, an ounce of salt in an ocean. It's, it's, it's nothing. Uh, India, when you talk about uh, India as a country and can you pr produce some, someone like Tesla, the, the country is quite chaotic. The country is being very, very vibrant. Chaotic everywhere. Chaotic in the, not in the sense of, you know, disturbances. But chaotic in the sense that the youths 
the grown-ups, everyone is in that valence electron kind of a thing, trying, wanting to do something. And this wanting to do something is actually driving them and making them think of various things at one point of time. You know, I want to do this. I want, I want to do AI. I want to do ML. I want to do, uh, you know, big data. I mean, you need to start really celebrating some of these failures as well. And we have to kind of encourage people to kind of go through that cycle. Only then we will be able to see successes like uh, Tesla, uh, right? So otherwise, uh, uh, right, if, uh, in this, if it is all in the search of mediocrity, it's going to really be hard for us to really those kinds of success stories. So I personally believe that really what is critical is for us as a society, uh, we have to really embrace failure uh, and uh, maybe in fact celebrate it, uh, right? Uh, because uh, entrepreneurship and all of this is really based on, uh, uh, it can go either way, right? There is a significant amount of risk uh, and that is critical for us to see a lot more Teslas in our societies. Brilliantly put, Vineet. That's a lovely point. And I think all of us as entrepreneurs have seen this day in, day out, right? I mean, it's uh, every day you have 20 failures and five successes, right? That's, that's how it goes. Uh, I have a gentleman, uh, a gentleman with a white jacket there at the back. Uh, I think there is tremendous amount of intellectual capital in our educational institutes, especially the, you know, there are millions of students and they are hungry and they are digital natives and AI and, and other technology comes, you know, natural to them. The hackathons we do with them, the ideas are mind boggling. I think there is some more, more thought needed to have incubators and it has started. I'm not saying we are not there incubators in all the wonderful education institutes that we have and, and in case students take those ideas forward. And any comment on how to do that will be useful. Uh, Yashraj, you've been... I think Vishal can also add. Yeah, yeah thanks, thanks a lot for that question. Uh, so, uh, and, and I really agree with that as well, uh, you know, uh, uh, coming from uh, a family personally also of uh, people into an academic background, I do see that there is uh, not just, uh, you know, an abundance of intellectual, uh, you know, talent in educational institutions, but more than that, it's now actually being uh, put to like, you know, actual application, whether it be in academia or industry as well, which is also a great thing. But more so directly to your question, uh, I have also like I, I also agree that uh, when it comes to startups or mid-sized organizations, uh, you know, and as uh, Toby just spoke about, you know, there is there is th there is not as strict a hierarchy as you would generally see in very large organizations. So you see a lot of people who are very very young uh, taking extremely senior or extremely. Uh, wide-ranging positions, right? And what that makes uh, other fellow students who are yet to graduate uh, also believe that yes, there is there is there is a career track which is far more compressed than they would probably see ten years ago. And hence, I do. And as a corollary to that, what uh, these uh, startups and these mid-sized orgs should also now double down on is they've seen that this this strategy actually working well because now if you have products and services that are built for millennials if they're built for people who are in the 20s or early 30s uh, they do agree that they should have a workforce also in that generation and if you're giving those kind of roles to those people might as well double down more on that and take advantage of the same kind of stuff like hackathons and all that you mentioned and hire hire people and create a pipeline out of that so that you know that okay this is a guy who's in his pre-final year uh, of his education that I am going to hire one year later and you kind of start like kind of uh, in, in taking in from that pipeline itself which we have done to a certain extent but I believe that could be done in a much wider ranging fashion as well. Yeah. Vishal, do you want to add? No. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, Ma'am, you had some points on the same question I guess. Uh, for the same question, I would like, I would just go for the same question. Uh, like uh, uh, now, is because of new education policy, we have this uh, programming and decoding in school syllabus also. So probably our kids will be more smarter than they are now. So we, uh, our, we, what we see as a principal, as a owner of the schools, what we see that uh, kids are uh, hoping and uh, they are willing only to go for the jobs. 
MNCs or going abroad. If we see such real heroes in our schools, if we can have such speakers in our schools also, and we, they can correlate with your stories, your success stories, your failure stories, then they will have real model rather than, than just a silver screen thing. So we want you people to write more, to visit our schools sometimes so that we can connect with you people and our kids can have such uh, enlightening session with them and they can relate to this thing that they have to be in India rather than going and abroad. Sure. <laughs> yeah. No, we all do it, sir. I mean, uh, we, we all, I personally, uh, like I said, uh, I just did a session with MIT two days back, and, and uh, personally, I keep going to schools and talking about things. So we are more than willing to collaborate. Probably ICRA, Raj, can become a, a, a kind of a collaboration point in this where uh, you tie up with educational institutions and yeah, get us to, uh, you can be the linking chain for this activity, and we'd love uh, to do this uh, at a personal level, right? Uh, all of us agree, we love, we love to come and talk to young minds and spread thoughts. And just a, one point to add in this piece, you know, and, and I was uh, uh, talking at Singapore at uh, uh, the Nanyang University, and what, what lovely thing they have is that if you're doing engineering and you want to set up a startup, that counts as course credit. Yeah. So it, it, it's, they don't give you a break. It counts as course credit, right? So it's a lovely philosophy. I think it's high time Indian universities and educational institutions started thinking about how to evaluate real life experience and award a degree on real life experience, right? I think that's something as a gap which I've seen still not happen, right? Still we believe a lot in that classroom and uh, teacher instructor kind of a model, you know, student kind of a model. If we go into real life learning, it'll be more interesting. Yeah. Just to add my two bits, and I think and, Vishal uh, yeah. Sir, and uh, just, well, just, sure. I'll just will do a quick thing, so, ma'am and sir. So, so to your point, I just add one more thing because a very important thing that Siddharth just brought up is, is around the safety net that an institution provides as an encouragement for you to start up. One of the biggest things is that there have been uh, a lot of very age old institutes in India, very importantly have now been starting this practice of a deferred placement. Because when you go into an engineering college, obviously because of family background, the pressure is to get a job, right? And that's the, that's where the expectation is, right? And it kind of is seen as a rebellious act still uh, by a lot of people to go and start up something. And to kind of change that, like, you know, it's a very cool thing that people have been coming up with now saying that, okay, there is a safety net if you want a job, you, ha you will get that two years later as well after graduating. You try a shot and start up, right? And see that if it works out for If it doesn't, we'll welcome you back and we'll, more than, we'll be more than happy to make you sit for placements in college, right? And, and to be honest, those people sometimes turn out to be better because, you know, uh, they have actually seen the ups and downs uh, of, of actually being in a company and, and seeing the rigors of, of actually running a firm. Um, and I, I do think that these kind of measures would, would also go a really, really long way. Yeah. Okay. So, so maybe yeah, just add. To, yeah. This come on. Yeah. There we go. Um, I think it's a, fant a really, really important point around education. Um, I think the only thing that I would add into the mix of it is I think we need to understand that learning technical skills is not in and of itself going to create the leaders that we want to produce that bring the transformation that we're hoping for. Um, so yes, role models, absolutely critical. But the culture around education is not just about technical acquisition of IQ, technical skills. So Google now take 35% of their new intake pre-university because they believe that university de-skills people for life in the new world. Um, because it's based on that kind of more classroom individual learning style. And actually, if you think about the breadth and dimensions of what it takes for an individual to be successful in the new world, IQ is only one dimension. Arguably, um, EQ, or your ability to be able to create high quality connections with another human being, is as valuable, if not more valuable, in the world that we live in. So collaboration is far more prized because we believe in organizations that it's teams that win, not individuals. So most organizations that are outperforming believe the smallest unit of their organization is a team, not an individual. So my, my performance mechanism inside of our business is not performance driving the individual, it's performance driving the team. Because it's teams that drive successful delivery of any service or product. And so thinking about how we are inside of education, building the right skill sets, not just IQ, 
but I would say EQ, which is your ability to build really high quality relationships and uh, um, what I call PQ, which is self-awareness. So you've got to know yourself to lead yourself. And a lot of people fail because they don't understand the impact that they have on other people because they haven't held a mirror up to themselves. Their perception and reality gap is too big. And so in terms of how we think about the development of leaders and particularly education about kids is we need to think about a balanced way of developing them so that their skill sets work in the real world, um, as, as we were saying. So it's a really, really important question. Um, so. Thanks, thanks, Toby. Thank you so much. Vishal, you still want to add? Or? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Thai Young Entrepreneurs Program is there since last about four years. They have been engaging 9 to 12 class students for uh, in a competition and then they go on to uh, state and national level and then international level as well. So, probably if you write to them, they will, they will listen to you. As well as Times of India, I think pre-pandemic started for two years. They were doing some competition across India for finding young entrepreneurs out of schools. Yeah. Possibly you can write to yeah. them as well. Very relevant resources. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, gentleman with the glasses. I think he's been waiting. And this is probably our last question, and then we'll close the session. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a wonderful session and uh, interactive uh, words were coming out from you all. Uh, I have just one question. When we're talking about the big companies like Apple, Tesla, and when you talk about coming in India and all, uh, there is a huge amount of risk is involved, right? Uh, like you talk about the cycle of failures, we say. Uh, or, so one failure I'll say is R&D failure. Uh, do you think like the country, uh, like uh, India is ready? for such kind of ecosystems because we know uh, what the failure ends at, uh, in India, right? We talk about marks if you talk about board exams, right? There is no knowing that you're going to engineering college or medical, but we want to know that how much you have scored. But in this ecosystem of education right now in India, are we ready for such kind of R&D failure? Just like we talk about bank giving you a loan, there is a guarantor behind it. Is there any guarantor for such kind of failures? <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, I'll just add one statement and then I'll let Himanshu answer this because I think he's excited about this uh, question. Uh, just one uh, small point on this. Uh, yes, it has taken some time. You know, it, uh, it initial days, the way we have grown up, our culture, you know, I remember when uh, I got out of college, searching a job itself was a big challenge, right? It used to be a big struggle uh, going from one place to the other. But things have changed in the last couple of decades, you know, and where we do see a small set of, for example, my case itself, come from a government service family, you know, middle class, not a rich entrepreneur background or not a rich business background. But when I went home and said that I'm quitting a very comfortable job, uh, uh, I was an executive vice president in a corporate before I started my company, right? And leaving a cushioned, comfortable job went home and I said, I, when I announced this, I thought I'm going to get a beating, right? I mean, my dad worked for Airport Authority of India for 27 years, and I kept saying that your resume looks pretty bland, doing the same thing for 27 years, right? <laughs> so, uh, but surprisingly, you know, both, uh, both of them were very, very excited about it. And I, they said that, great, great, we don't think uh, you're a fool, you, you must have thought about it. And uh, you've proven that, yes, you can do things and you can make a career. And now you want to set up a company, go ahead. More than... We are going to move on.